Hi everyone, we'll get started in a minute and uh, we're going to be joined by uh, Amanda today who's going to do our introduction and welcome to country <clears throat> and we also have Phoebe here as well who will be monitoring the questions. Um, so if it makes sense we'll stop along the way and um, Amanda or myself will ask any questions and then we'll see how we go. And I just looked at the uh, participants and we've got 55. So it's pretty funny because when we um, do these webinars, it's always about a third of registration. So we've got about 166 register and at the moment we've got 55 people that have joined the webinar, which is pretty amazing. Um, I'm probably going to let Amanda off the hook a bit. I'll, I'll just do the introduction. Um, so um, welcome to this Vision Australia webinar on exploring tech with Dave Woodbridge, which is me. And on this particular one, we're doing common Android and iOS apps. So Android slash Samsung, iPhone slash iOS. Um, and I'm also going to be talking about the benefits of both either Samsung or Apple. And then I'll also be talking about some nifty hardware that will work on both systems. So um, besides one that I'll get to in a minute. Um, but before we start, I just like to recognize the people of our first, sorry, <coughs> our first generation people that own the land on which we met today. And it's all around Australia. So I'm not going to pick out any particular one. And I'd like to pay my respect to elders past and emerging. Um, what I want to also let you know is that this webinar will be recorded. So if you want to view it later on via the Vision Australia YouTube channel, you can also do that. And the chat will be the main way to ask questions on this webinar. Now, I noticed last time when we had the chat function running, the chat function was disabled. So hopefully it's going to be enabled this time um, and people will be able to ask questions. Thanks, Michael, uh, for that check on the on the chat. So that's good to know. Um, and for people that want to use uh, the chat function, if you're using Windows, it's Alt-H. And if you're using a Mac, of course, it's Command-H. Command All right. Well, look, with that, um, let me jump into it. Um, <laughs> Excellent. All right. So let me start. I'm actually going to start with Android first um, and then we'll go into iPhone. So the first thing I want to let you know that is that when we say Android at Vision Australia, we're really talking about the, the Samsung phones. Um, I know there are Nokia ones and, and other brands, but the Samsung ones seem to be the most stable one because one thing that happens with Android is that when different manufacturers get hold of the original <clears throat> Android version, they make modifications to it, which normally means that the version you're using on your Nokia or on your Samsung or your HTC or your Motorola is a slightly different version of the original Android that's running on the, the Google Pixel phones. And sometimes those changes can have effects for accessibility. <clears throat> so, for example, um, there was a Chinese phone, and I want to say almost Optima, but that may not be the model. But for some odd reason, with the screen reader talk back on that phone, the up and down arrow wouldn't read out the content on the screen. And it was just because of the version of Android that was on that phone. So... That's one thing to be a bit careful about is the version of Android and what they call the fault version or the change version running on that particular manufacturer's phone. I do mean Google Pixel phones when, I'm, when I say Android. Um, I don't particularly like the Pixel phones. <laughs> so um, I haven't actually got around to buying one. So I tend to use a Samsung phone. <clears throat> Um, speaking of Samsung, let me just grab mine. So I've got, actually I just realized one, I, these are these are the phones that I use all the time, by the way. So I've just realized I've left my other phone 
out on my coffee machine, but I have two Samsung phones that I use all the time. So this is one that people that follow me on Twitter and, and, and that sort of stuff. This is my favorite phone. This is a flip phone um, from Samsung. Um, so if I open it up, Device. my fingerprint on it, it just opens it up VA Vision Store Marketing Meeting. and it also starts starts talking to me. So that basically when I've got it open, this will be very similar to my other Screen Samsung off. phone, which is my Samsung S10. So it's just a, a flat, if you like, a what they call it basically a, a brick phone. Um, the nice thing about this particular one, because it flips shut and open, is that when I get an incoming call, I can open it up to answer or I can close it to hang up. So open to answer, close to hang up. But on both the phones, on both the, the standard Samsung S10 <clears throat> and the Z, Z Flip 3, which is the fold one here I've got in my hand, it also allows me to assign actions to the physical button. So I can assign answer to my volume up key and the power button when I'm on a phone call is the end call key. So I've got control over the phone either from the, the two physical buttons or in my case, I can just open, and, screen off. open and close the phone, which actually works really nicely. The other really nice thing about this particular phone that I like over my Samsung S10 is that on the power button just here, 107 p.m. Excuse it, talking to all the time on the power button. It's also got a touch Screen ID. Off. So for people that have had a look at, for example, the latest iPad Mini, that's also got touch ID on the power button. So uh, rather than having to use Face ID um, or on my S10, the touch is actually under the screen, so I can't don't like quite know where it is. This one works really well because it's actually a physical button. I put my finger over the button. I know where the button it is because it's physical and then just unlocks the phone. Um, so that works really nicely. The other thing, I guess, in some ways that makes the Android operating system a little bit easier to use in some ways to do with than the iPhone or iOS in general. And when I mean iOS, I mean iPhone, iPod Touch or iPad is the fact that you've got a, a like like iOS you've got a consistent user interface but but what I like is that down the bottom of all your screens you've always got from left to right on the left hand side you've got a back button in the middle you've got a home button and the right hand side you've got a recent which is like the app switcher in iOS so as long as you can locate those by vision or via the screen reader talk back then you're really not going to get into much trouble because as we all probably all know, particularly for, for speech users, voiceover users on iOS, so iPhone, iPod Touch and iPad, lots of people have trouble with those gestures where you've got to drag your finger up from the bottom, drag your finger down from the top to get to your home, um, your back, your, you know, your control center, your notification center. Whereas this one, it's done by these buttons down the bottom of the screen. So from that point of view, for some people, it's a little bit easier to find the back, home and recent buttons rather than going, you know, drag up from the bottom, wait for the first vibration, click, go to the second one, that's your home. You keep going, that's your app switcher or your recents on Android terms. And then the other one, like I just said, the other ones came from the top of your control center and your notification center. So that's an, one nice thing about the Android is that the, the buttons down the bottom of the screen. I've already mentioned the fact that you can assign uh, answer and hang up to the, the volume and the power button. And of course, with the flip phone, hang up and answer by opening and closing the phone. The other really cool thing is that you've got a little bit tighter integration over your uh, personal assistant. So by default on Samsung, you've got Bixby, which is sort of okay for launching applications, but then you've also got pretty good tight integration of either the Google Assistant or Amazon Alexa, uh, because you can actually tell the Amazon, sorry, <laughs> you can tell the Amazon phone, you can actually tell the Android phone, in this case Samsung, to default 
to what personal assistant you want to use, whether it's the A Lady, Google Assistant, um, or in my case, the the Bixby one. So I've, I've got all three on mine. Um, and the reason why I do have all three on mine is because Bixby is default, so I might as well just keep using it. Google Assistant gives me lots of information as far as transport information. And of course, Amazon Alexa allows me to play my Audible and Kindle books from Amazon. So I sort of use those personal assistants in, in different ways. Um, the other cool thing about the Android systems, particularly the phones, you've got, you've got a much wider range of phones, features, and price points. So the flip phone that I've got here is fairly expensive. I think it's about $1,700. Um, so it is a fairly expensive phone, but you can get phones. I remember get, getting a phone about six months ago or so from Audi. Um, I can't remember the name of it. It was just an Audi thing that was about $195 or something. And that worked with TalkBack absolutely beautifully. Um, so again, TalkBack's a screen reader on Android. And again, I had the consistent interface, the, the back, the home, the recents. Um, I had the app screen that I could just scroll through all that sort of very nice stuff. So you can go from a very cheap, okay phone up to a very expensive one. And oddly enough, some of the apps that oh, run... 11 p.m. Oh, thank Dismiss. you. Button. Some of the apps that run on uh, Android are sometimes a little bit more productive than the ones that run Screen on off. iOS, which is really weird. And I'll give you a couple examples. So, for example, the Coffee Link app that I use... Um, on my touch coffee machine out in the kitchen and it's been fixed recently but for a long time i was using the coffee link app on my samsung phone to use the coffee machine because the the ios version wasn't that fantastic um you know it's improved since i used it but i've got so used to using my samsung phone with my coffee machine that i just haven't changed back the two apps that are really cool to use though on Android is because you can buy things inside them, unlike on the iOS device, is Audible and Kindle. So when I browse books on the Audible app or the Kindle app, I can actually buy those books um, within both systems. Whereas on the, the iOS side of things, the iPhone side of things, Yes, you can buy books if you've got credits, but if you don't, you've then got to go back to the website, log in with your Audible or Kindle account and buy the books that way, and then they come up in your library. Whereas with the Audible and the Amazon ones, you can buy them uh, direct within the app, which I quite like when I'm buying lots of science fiction and, and fantasy type books. Um, the... I guess some of the, so, so far I've been seeing the praises of um, Android. Um, you know, over, overall, um, talkback wise, screen reader wise, screen magnification wise, voice control wise, uh, physical control wise, um, you know, hearing, hearing difficulty wise, cognitive wise, everything else. The, the Android phone is basically fine. When it becomes sort of unfine and a little bit clunky, um, is when you go outside sort of the main applications, and I'll get onto the apps in a minute, but when you get to sort of, you know, um, Blue Dog's body app for whatever else it might be in the back of whoop, whoop somewhere, um, and they haven't done proper accessibility or whatever testing, then you'll find that buttons don't talk, the screens don't talk properly, um, the screen reader locks up or the focus view jumps all over the place. That's when you have issues. But if you use main apps like ABC Listen, ABC iView, Audible, Kindle, all those sort of ones, then the experience is fine. Um, the other thing about TalkBack in particular, the screen reader, which does not currently have this feature, uh, in iOS now, if you come across a photo or an image on the web, um, then the system will actually read it out to you. It'll actually tell you that it's a man and a woman sitting at a park bench with trees behind them. So you really need a good detailed description. The other thing that's currently not in Android phones either, as far as I know, is the LiDAR function. So the LiDAR function is where you've got that 
light bouncing off an object. And depending on how long it takes to get back to the sensors is how far that's away. Um, so I can tell, you know, in good old COVID terminology, how far somebody's standing away from me. So, you know, 0.5 metres, one metre and so on. But the other thing that uh, they've also introduced as part of that LiDAR, which is in the magnification app in the iPhone, is some object recognition to tell you what objects are in front of you or if there's a door and which way that door may be opening and whether it's got a handle or it pushes or pulls open. Um, so that's actually fairly interesting. So that's type of stuff's not currently in um, what the Android operating system offers. Um, of course, the other thing about Samsung, and this is what I'm hoping that the iPhone does uh, sooner than later, is USB-C. Because most things these days work around USB-C. Um, so hopefully, who knows, in the iPhone 14 coming out in September, um, then we'll get USB-C. The other really nice thing about Android, of course, is that you can extend the memory of it. So in my S10, um, I could put a memory card in the S10 and I can expand the memory of it. Um, so, of course, with iPhone, you buy a 128 gig iPhone and that's what you actually end up with. Um, what I'm going to do now... I'm going to start talking whoops, a little bit about iPhone and or system apps at the moment. So I've got my iPad running a Zoom meeting. Screen off. Whoops, let me just I go to my lines. Hmm, that's interesting. It doesn't want to come up with the thing. Let me just find where my screen is. All right, so that's going to work this time. Nope, it's going to be painful. All right, let me just try that again. Okay, let me just try. What I'm doing, just for people that want to know, I'm actually getting my line function reading with voiceover on my iPad and I didn't have proper, I didn't have focus on the actual body of the Pages app. Um, one thing I did forget to mention, which is very, very naughty, naughty of me, is browse support on Android is absolutely dismal. Um, it's probably about a third as, as functional of what you get on iOS. Um, so if you are a Braille user and you like to use Braille all the time, uh, do not use Android because you'll be very disappointed. Um, you know, there are still a few bugs in the iPhone with Braille display support, um, but it's not too bad. I'm going to show you a device. So this is my on-loan Bryant 40. So it's a 40-cell Braille display. Of course, this works on both Android for a bit of fiddling, um, but USB-C wise, it works perfectly fine. And on the iPhone and also the 20 cell version of the brain. So the, both the brain BIX 20 and the BIX 40 work really nicely, both as with inputting on the Braille keyboard and also reading with the Braille display. They work really nicely. Um, so like I said, if you're a Braille user, um, iOS, so iPhone, iPod Touch or iPad, and definitely either the Bryant 20 um, or the, the Bryant 40. Okay. Let me just come down my document. All right. So just to remind you that there are a couple of apps that are not available on Android than they are on iOS. And the two main ones are the Soundscape app, which is Microsoft's GPS app to let you know what's around you in surround sound. That's not available on Android. And the other app that we all love to use uh, on the iPhone in particular is the CAI app. And of course, that's the app that's got all these wonderful things in it, such as barcode reading, which they call product identification. Uh, short text function, which is basically point your camera anything and have it read out to you, document reading, currency mode identification, uh, face recognition, screen, uh, sorry, scene environment recognition, 
Uh, it also has its own LiDAR function. So remember we talked about LiDAR before in the environment. This one will also detect and you can put beacons on objects inside a room. So that's also really, really cool. Um, as far as sort of the alternative to the Seeing AI app uh, for Android, the Lookout app, uh, which does a lot of OCR, barcode reading, um, object recognition, works really nicely. Um, and as far as the app is concerned for GPS, there's one called Lazarillo, um, and that works really nicely on both iPhone and Samsung or Android. All right, um, let me just go through these quickly. Um, now, my rationale for accessibility on these ones is, is a bit loose. As long as you can get to do the main function, then it sort of passes my, does it do the job that you really, really want it to do? Um, so, for example, the first couple of these, so 7 Plus, 10 Play, SBS On Demand, I wouldn't classify them as being absolutely 100% perfect, but you can certainly get the get the job done. Um, ABC iView works pretty nicely, um, although I wish it could be a little bit better. Um, ABC Listen, which is uh, ABC's listing of all their radio programs, podcasts, and audiobooks, works really nicely on, on both platforms. Um, I did notice, though, on my Z Flip 3, so currently it's Z Flip 4, so this is the, the version of the phone from last year, there was a feature in the phone. Now, for the life of me off the top of my head, I can't remember what it was, but if I didn't turn this feature on, every time my screen reader, TalkBack, would start talking, it would stop the radio or any other media from playing. As soon as the screen reader stopped talking, the thing would kick back in again. So I've got no idea why it did that. Um, it never did it on my S10. Um, so I don't know if it was, it was just something odd. But if you do come across a new Android phone um, and the media stops every time you are doing talk back the screen reader, um, there is a function in there which when you see it's pretty obvious, it's got something to do with uh, audio multimedia support. Um, so just be aware of that, that that is something that actually will happen. Um, ABC News, that's just all the new stuff coming from out of the ABC in Australia. Um, Ira works really well. Of course, that's the video service that you can link up uh, for five minutes free or get a subscription. I've got a person that can see through your camera what's around you. Um, to support the phone, either the, the um, Samsung phone or the iPhone, you can use uh, your phone in a chest harness, so it's facing forward on your chest. You can also get a neck lanyard, so the actual phone's hanging around your neck. Now, what I found with those ones is that because it's around your neck on this sort of lanyard, the phone pops around and floats around a little bit, so the poor sighted person on the other end is not getting a good image. So I like the fact about the chest harness because the chest harness holds it still. And these chest harnesses are mainly from people that go on uh, mountain bike riding and they want to, you know, you know, they want to film or video their tremendous feats of um, dexterity when they're bouncing around in the countryside, mountain climbing with their bicycles. Um, and where I got mine one was a website called camgo.com.au, camgo.com.au. And in there, you'll just see one that says uh, phone chest mount. And it was about $39 when I bought mine, um, and it works really nicely. And, again, because it's actually sitting on your chest, um, then it doesn't move around that much. Um, so it's actually quite a good thing to do. So the chest harness for Ira Orf, in that case, Be My Eyes, which is a similar service, but it's run by volunteers. Um, Audi app from Audi works beautifully. Um, let me just scroll my screen because my screen doesn't want to scroll. Hang on, too. Oh, that's interesting. My screen's not scrolling today. Um, let me just do this again. I like it when, uh, that's right. Let me just try this again. 
Okay, I've now got the up arrow down arrow and up arrow working, but I've now gone to the bottom of my document. Okay, no, it's not scrolling properly. Never mind. All right, I'm going to do most of this from memory because I know most of them anyway. All right, so we've done the A's basically. I've done B for B my eyes. There's a really cool driving app. Um, which I absolutely love as a blind person, and it's called Blind Drive. And what Blind Drive is, is you're driving against traffic. So you've got these irate side of people driving towards you, beeping and honking the horns and yelling at you, and you have to avoid the oncoming cars as they come towards you. So you have to sort of like veer left and veer right, and you go through different um, scenes, you go through a tunnel, you go through a thunderstorm with the, the rain hitting against your windscreen, so it's hard to hear. Um, all really cool things, and it's free, so it's called Blind Drive, and you just turn talk back off. I'll turn voiceover off on your iPhone, and it's very, very cool, and it's fun to use. So, that's, um, so that was Blind Drive. Um, the web browser that I tend to use on my iPhone and I guess on my Mac as well and as well as my Windows computer is always been Chrome. So I, I tend to use Chrome most of the time for my web browser and I don't tend to use Safari unless there's something specific that I need to use in Safari. So mainly it's Chrome. And the other really cool app that I use uh, all the time is called Calm. So Calm is where you can... Uh, pay for a subscription you can download these sort of beautiful sort of different types of scene like infinite shoreline which is just the ocean coming in and sort of rolling off from right to left um you could have like forest sounds uh, my favorite one is water coming into a bay and as it rolls in with the water up to the sand you can also hear the birds on the trees um, on either side of the bay and then off in the distance you can actually hear the roar of the surf so just really good calming meditation ones there's also ones to sort of inspire you and focus you and all that sort of stuff um, but the, the calm app is certainly my my favorite one um, who where would where would it be in the world without dropbox so <laughs> dropbox works beautifully on both systems um, so I know I've got Dropbox running across my Windows, Mac, my iPhone, my Android, my iPad, and it all works flawlessly well. Um, I don't tend to use Microsoft Edge too much, although I can use it on, on, on iOS. Um, it's not too bad. I just remembered one thing I did not mention was two music services, uh, jumping back to the A's, which was Apple Music works beautifully on Android, of course, as it does on iOS and also Amazon Music that also works really nicely. Um, by default, I tend to use uh, Apple Music and Spotify. So they're two, they're two of my main music sources that I, that I tend to use most of the time. Um, the other app, and, I, and I'm sort of jumping around a bit here in the, in the alphabet as they sort of come to my brain, but one thing that I use all the time particularly when I'm traveling on public transport in Sydney and in Melbourne, there's an app called TripView and you've got TripView Sydney or TripView Melbourne and I'm pretty sure that Brisbane and so on, they've got their own transport apps. And that's where you can check out, you know, your timetable for your ferry, bus, tram, train and so on. But what I particularly like about it is that you can also find out what platform the actual train is leaving from. So when I rock up to Central and I've got, you know, 19 platforms to choose from or Stroudfield where I've got eight platforms or Gosford where I've got five, oh, five, no, maybe it's four. But anyway, yeah, so you can actually very quickly determine where the trains are leaving from. So that one's actually very, very handy. As far as fitness goes, um, I sort of split myself between two different systems. So remember I said at the beginning, I was going to try and make it so that whatever hardware you buy, you can use it on both systems. So I tend to use the old classic Fitbit charge range. So these are ones, in, they're not the Fitbit watch, they're just the, the Fitbit hardware with a, little, a tiny little touch screen going across. It's almost like little, wearing a tiny little rectangular something on your wrist um i've got my charge two i believe it's up to charge five now but 
rather than you know as a blind person like i can't see the little rectangular touch screen on the on the fitbit so i tend to get all the information off the fitbit through the fitbit app even on uh either via android or ios with whatever screen mode i'm using and that works beautifully so i can get things i can do sleep monitoring i can do heart rate checking i can do how many calories i'm burning and go check how far i've walked all that sort of really really cool stuff um and the other one that I use because I'm a, also an Apple user is I tend to use the Apple Watch, which is integrated very nicely. And of course, for Apple Watch users, you'll always hear us talk about our rings. You know, the fact that we're closed our rings for the day. And of course, they're the exercise ring, um, the move ring and the stand ring. Um, and you, you'll often hear uh, Apple Watch users saying, oh God, I had to... I, you know, my watch just told me to get up. I'm now going to get up when I'm being in the car, for example. But it just there's something really satisfying about knowing that you've got 100% of your rings closed and it really does tend to keep you moving. Um, the other bit of hardware that I use probably for my Samsung phone, which is doesn't, the new version does not work with the iPhone, the previous version did, is the Galaxy Watch 4. And from an accessibility point of view, I'd have to say it's really, really sluggish. So if you've ever heard voiceover running on the original Apple Watch Series Zero, which is the first one that came out, if you thought that was a bit sluggish with voiceover, so when you flick left and right, um, then I can pretty much guarantee and assure you that talkback on the Galaxy Watch is even slower. Um, it's just the pull, you feel like the poor little person inside the watch is pedaling as fast as they can um, and can't quite keep up with the fact they've got to run the operating system, the application and the assistive technology. It's too hard for it. Um, the find my function. So when you want to locate your, your phone or vice versa, when you want to locate your, on this case, probably your Apple watch or even your Galaxy watch if you did have one, they work both really nicely. Um, so both of those functionalities are available on, on both phones and, again, work absolutely beautifully. As far as podcasting is concerned, um, if you want to be cross-platform again between iOS and Android, Pocket Cast works really nicely on both systems. Um, and because you can synchronise it between you know, your iPhone and your Samsung phone, then whatever you've listened to or where you're up to date on one will be where you're up to date and whatever else on the, on the other one. So that actually works really nicely. Um, I've already mentioned Spotify. Um, as far as some of the video streaming services are concerned, the two, well, actually, no, the three ones that I tend to use, um, let's put the TV one aside for the iOS devices because that's really only on iOS. Um, but Amazon Prime, Netflix and Disney all work pretty much fairly well. And of course, quite a lot of the content coming out now um, from those streaming services is audio described and they work really nicely. Um, so again, if you don't want to be a, a TV subscriber, an Apple TV subscriber, um, definitely check out Amazon Video, Netflix, and of course, Disney, and they all work really, really nicely. Um, Radio apps, and this is more for streaming. So I know with you know our, our friend Siri on iOS and Bixby on Samsung and then Amazon Alexa um, and Google, that we can actually run radio programs and that sort of stuff via those personal assistants. Um, I tend to use TuneIn Radio uh, as a way to also get stations manually. Because sometimes when I ask my personal assistant to play a particular radio station, um, it doesn't quite get it, particularly if the name's a bit obscure. Um, so I fall back on TuneIn Radio and, and do it that way. Um, social stuff, social media stuff. Um, I know some people don't like the Twitter application. Um, people on iOS tend to use the Spring app or the Twitterific app on iOS. But the Twitter app works perfectly well on both platforms, both Android and Samsung. So, um, you know, you can get your notifications, you can see what's trending, you can create and check your lists, uh, you can direct message people, 
all the stuff you could normally ever do on, say, Twitterific on, on the iPhone, um, you can do with Twitter. And, of course, Facebook's Facebook. Um, I don't tend to use Facebook, but when I go in there, I, I can normally see what news has happened, what people have replied to me, if people sent me a message, particularly via Facebook Messenger. Um, that works all very nicely as well. Um, there's a few other apps, but they're probably sort of the, the, the main ones that I tend to use. Um, I guess the final one that I probably really should mention is Voice Dream Reader, and that's for reading documentation. Um, so things like PDF files, doc files, text files, RTF files, all that sort of stuff um, will be definitely read by the Voice Dream Reader app. Um, and I can't remember how much that costs, but it's 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 a, an extremely worthwhile app. That one. Um, I'm just going to check my time. It's only 36 because I have a I have a bad habit of rambling on too much. Let me move on. And I, I I know I spent some more time talking about Android in the beginning. I did mention a few things about iOS to do with lidar and that sort of stuff. Um, we've just finished with most of the common apps. Um, I am probably going to post a blog uh, on my davidwoodbr.podbean.com website or my other one on Pinecast, but it'll probably be on the main IC podcast page. Um, and I'll, whatever I've talked about today will be actually in those that blog post. So, um, so if I have missed out any apps, which I'm sure I've done, um, then they'll be up to date on that blog thing that I'll post this evening. Um, but just getting back to uh, VoiceOver for the moment or iOS in general. So, yes, we do have LiDAR. Um, like I said before, I, I just wish we had a bit more functionality about answering and hanging up um, phone calls. We do have the, um, the better Braille support. Um, one thing that's available on both is that you can definitely plug in a QWERTY keyboard to both platforms and navigate. And I should say the way that you navigate on the iPhone is different to the way you navigate on with a keyboard on Android. So Android's a bit more, it's probably like using Windows with a keyboard. So you can tap around, you can arrow around. There's not really that many screen reader commands that you can use, or if not at all, um, there may be a few. Um, but primarily um, you can tab and up and down and hit enter to activate something. So it's pretty straightforward to use a, a keyboard with the keyboard on iOS, so with VoiceOver in particular, you've got much more control over the environment because you are truly using the screen reader to navigate the screen. Because if I wasn't using a uh, VoiceOver on the iPhone or the iPad, the only thing I could use my keyboard for on an iPhone is where I would be typing into an edit field, whether that's a password field a form or a document, um, whereas the keyboard access on Android, it doesn't care whether you're using TalkBack or not, a screen reader. It's just designed to allow you to navigate. Now, I've got a few keyboards here I wanted to show you. So first of all, this is just a, a normal everyday magic keyboard that you can also grab from the Vision Stray store. Um, and I can plug this in via lightning cable to my iPhone or use it via Bluetooth, or I can plug it in via a USB-C to lightning cable to whatever Samsung phone I'm using, also connect it via Bluetooth, and it just works like a normal USB keyboard. So that's that particular one. The other one is these are the really cheap... Uh, USB keyboards that we sell at Business Australia, and they're basically fifteen dollars. Um, and you can get white on black, black on white, and yellow on black. And I would say to people, at the end of the day, always have a real computer keyboard at your disposal, because it comes in really handy if your desktop, you know, Bluetooth keyboard goes flat and you can't plug it in like you can with a lightning cable on the back of a magic keyboard um, or for some other reason something doesn't work, when you plug in a, a proper keyboard into the USB slot of the USB-C slot, it pretty well works. So because we've got this traditional here, you can see on my one here, 
Well, I've got that little connection which takes a USB A connector and puts it down to a USB C connection, and that's how I can plug it into my Samsung phone, whether it's the S10 or the flip phone, and it just works absolutely beautifully. Um, Speaking of keyboards, speaking of keyboards, this is also a nice little keyboard that I tend to use because I'm a Braille user. So this is called, and I'm going to hold it up the right way. It's called the Orbit Writer. So it's it's a six key at the top for basically Perkins style input. Um, as in the Braille keyboard, you've got an up and down, left and right, and a select in the middle, a space bar, and some dots on the left and right of it. But if you just simply wanted to use this to navigate um, voiceover or talk back on either the iPhone or the Samsung phones, you could literally just get away with pressing left and right arrow and pressing select in the middle and then just learning some basically, I guess, spacebar and other keyboard combinations to do your navigation. Um, so sometimes I'm, if I'm in a restaurant, and I want to use, use a keyboard, I'm not going to get out my full-size <laughs> full size keyboard. I'm actually going to use this to navigate because it's going to be much easier and more straightforward for me to use it. So this is the Orbit Writer as opposed to the Orbit Reader 20 or 40, which is the Braille display one. This is purely a keyboard input. And the nice thing about this one is that you can use it up to five Bluetooth devices and one USB device. So I can, on this particular one, I've got it set up so I can switch between my iPhone and my iPad and both my Samsung S10 and my Samsung Z Flip phone as well, just with one keyboard. Um, and that really does come in handy. And speaking about switching between keyboards, um, now I know Business Australia doesn't sell this one, but this is one that I tend to use. This is the Logitech keyboard, and I think it's the K... Oh, geez, I can't remember what code number it is, but basically you can get lots of different Logitech keyboards that support uh, multiple Bluetooth devices. So on this one, I can press F1 to F3. And this particular one, I've got it set up so I can switch between my iPhone, my iPad, and my Mac just by pressing F1, F2, and F3. So I'm just using one keyboard to do all three of them. Um, so that comes in quite handy. Whoops, I just said new long to me. <laughs> um, now, I, I can't remember how I was talking to you. Earlier this week, somebody asked me a question about stands because it's okay to type on your keyboard. It's okay to use voice recognition. It's okay to use the touch screen. But when it comes to doing things like um, object recognition, optical character recognition, using your phone as a video magnifier. So rather than having to buy a, an expensive video magnifier, you can buy your smartphone and then put it in a stand. So um, just grab the stand from my desk. Ugh. Okay. So this, this stand, so we've got... That's the main pole of the stand. Ouch, just hit myself in the head with it. Um, and then we've got these arms that come out and they're actually articulated. So I can adjust these arms into any position. And then right at the end of it, I've got like this claw that I can then fit around my, uh, you know, my smartphone. And because this is on a pivot, I can actually have it pivot down. So I can have my phone pointing down towards the ground. I can point it forward. I could also ouch again. I could also rotate it all over the place. So this is the Archon desk stand, and again, it doesn't matter what phone I'm using, um, as long as the phone fits in between those two arms, then I'm fine. So I've used this with my iPhone S10 right up to my um, my 12 Pro. I've used it on my Samsung S10, even on the on the flip phone when it's fully open. And this is just a really, really nice um, stand to use. So again, this is the Archon Desk smartphone stand. Um, and as I keep saying, with most of this stuff, um, you can use it with whatever you're using, um, iPhone or, or Android. Um, 
the other things I was going to mention was headphone wise. Now, I've had this plugged in and charging. This is the Aftershocks um, Open Com. So these are the, the ones that have got the little boom mic on the side. Um, and again, you can have these synced up to work with both systems. So you can have it set up to work with, um, in my case, I've got what this set up to work with my flip phone and also the iPhone. Um, and because the boom's coming down here and it's actually part of, sorry, and it's getting the microphone close to your mouth, you get really good sound when you're on a phone call. Um, and they just work really nicely. And, of course, being bone conduction, um, the little pads sit on your cheekbones and transmits the audio through your cheekbones so you can sort of hear rather than having things over your ears, which is particularly handy when you're out and about in, in public. Um, I'm just going to pause there for a minute because I've just realised I've been chatting so long. Does anybody have any questions at this point? And I'll just pause for a bit. No? Okay. All right. If you think of a question or you're still typing, just type away and hit enter, um, and then I'll, I'll answer anything as, as we keep going. Two people have raised their hand, David. Okay. So Michael Norris has raised his hand. Yep. Michael, do you want to ask a question? Just do it via the chat. So remember Alt-H or Command-H if you're using a Mac. Off, mate. Bye. Oh, you're live, actually. Your audio is live. Oh, oh well. Do you want, do you want, we'll talk then. You can talk then in that case. <laughs> do you want to ask a question? Hmm, that was a bit odd. I think Mike was muted himself. Well, um, Michael, if you have a question, feel free to pop it in the chat box and we'll respond to you there. Yeah. Yeah, that's really funny because normally the webinar disables the um, the audio function. So, hmm, never mind. All right. Well, I'll just keep. Does, anyone, does the other person want to ask a question or I'll yes. just keep going? Uh, so, Jeffrey Kirby has raised his hand yep. as well. All right. Jeff, do you have a, do you want to type in a question? I think he's gone as well, David. I think we can just continue with the webinar. Sorry about <laughs> okay. that. I just, I just, yeah, I do, I, I do tend to uh, get away talking sometimes. I suddenly realised, yes, I probably was talking too much. That's okay. All right, actually, so. we have a question from Julie, mm -hmm. um, and her question is, how do you set up the desk stand to see the magnifier? So what you would basically do is you'd set it up so that the, that little claw at the end would be facing down and then your phone goes into the, the little claw to, or the clamp to hold it. Um, and so what I tend to do is I tend to run the magnifier up in this case, which is also the video magnifier, make sure it's running first. And because it does auto focusing, I then put it in the stand into the, into the clamp and then it'll auto-focus on the document once I put it underneath it. And keep in mind with the magnifier, you can adjust um, the colours. So, you know, you can have white on blue or black on white or whatever else you might want to have. And, of course, you can also zoom in and zoom it out. Um, but the only problem is, I guess, because it's in, the it's in the clamp, then it's a little bit hard to sort of modify things that you're adjusting it. Yeah, I've never heard of the mag stand for iPad, but it's okay. Um, so there's there's different options. I mean, the reason why I got this one is that it also it doesn't support an iPad. Um, you can also get other ones. Um, most people that I know don't tend to use their iPad as a magnifier. Um, they normally use it for viewing, entertainment, documentation, that sort of stuff. Um, I suppose my, the only people that I know that I use a magnifier on an, on an iPad is if they're using an iPad mini. 
um, which is a 7.9 inch screen, not your 12.9 inch or your 11 inch one. It's just a bit too bulky. Um, there used to be a really good stand that I used to love to use all the time. I think it might be still around, but it's called the Belkin Stage Stand. And if you can imagine in old measurements, this sort of two feet by two feet, so 60 centimetres square um, with a pole on the corner. It then had a stand coming up out of that corner. Then it had a platform on top where you laid the iPad flat. And that was to, to use for lab work. So you could zoom in the camera onto what was on the platform as part of your scientific experiment. And then you would normally have that going through an Apple TV onto a big screen or monitor. Um, and that used to work really, really nicely. Um, so that was a, that was the other way I used to use stuff as well. Um, let me just check how we're time. Sorry. Okay, so we've got about nine minutes left. I just want to quickly... So, David, a few questions that have come through. Would you like me to read them for you? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, so um, someone's asked, could you repeat where I can find the blog that you'll be posting? Yep, so that's David Woodbr. So David Woodbridge, David Woodbr.podbean, P O D B A N dot com. Okay, and the next one is uh, Do I need an Apple TV to see it on a bigger screen? Nope. nope. So as long as you have a. You can buy an adapt. You can buy an adapter um, for your iPad or even your iPhone. So it's called a Lightning or a USB-C to HDMI adapter, and then that allows you to then plug your iPhone or your iPad into your television screen. So you'd simply choose one of your HDMI channels. You know, channel one, channel two, channel three. Plug the adapter into the iPad or the iPhone, um, and then whatever comes up on your iPhone or iPad screen will be on your big TV screen as well. So it's just that adapter. So if it's an iPhone, it's a lightning to HDMI adapter. If it's your um, iPad, then it's a USB to HDMI adapter. Okay. And we have another question. Have mm -hmm. you got any recommendations for apps or browser plugins for students studying at uni? Anything particular handy you might know of? No. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 so um remember particularly on ios you've got this really cool function called reader mode and what reader mode does it actually strips out all the actual html code on the page so you know on a normal web page where you've got combo boxes check boxes hyperlinks advertising well, when you choose the little icon at the top of the screen or voiceover just calls it reader, when you choose reader mode, it strips out all the stuff and you've just, you're just left with the article on the page. So reader mode, um, Microsoft Edge also has it as well. Um, for any articles you're reading online, like law cases and that sort of stuff, it works absolutely beautifully. So I would be using the, the reader mode more often um, than anything if I was reading articles and doing a lot of, you know, reference reading online. Okay, and there's another question. I was wondering whether there is a good app or software for Mac that reads Word docs well. I do find the voice inbuilt a bit clunky. Yeah, um, oh, yeah, I agree. <laughs> um, do not use Microsoft Word. Microsoft Word is very annoying because it's got so many different ways to read the screen. I get lost in voiceover. Um, I, I honestly use text edit uh, to read either RTF or doc or dot X files because it's just a clean interface. The only thing you've got on the screen with text edit is the ruler bar area and the edit area, which is the, the main document. Um, I also don't read stuff with pages because, again, pages is like Word. You've got so many sort of different areas on the screen to get confused by that I tend to find I spend more time navigating than actually reading. So because text is so basic, um, it, and because it is so basic, it just tends to work straight off. So if I was reading anything, 
I'd start using um, text edit. Um, all right, before we finish, I just want to mention two, two phones. Yeah, I have a habit of reading fast. I just I just heard that one. Um, all right, so this is the Blind Shell Classic 2, which has been on social media lately. Um, and this the reason why I'm mentioning it today is because this is actually based on Android. It does have its own, quote, forked version of Android in here to support the Blind Shell Classic 2, and it's simply a, a talking phone. So if I unlock 13.55. Call one of seven. So call messages. Two of seven messages. Contacts. Three of seven contacts. Applications. Four of seven applications. Settings. Five of seven settings. Manual. Six of seven manual. Turn off the phone. Seven of seven and turn off the phone and so on. So literally, this is built around an up and down arrow. Select to select an item or your back button to go back. And at the moment, it's got round about, well, overall, it's got 48 applications. Um, some are not, which won't work in Australia, but um, I think it's about 40 of them will work in, in, in Australia. So things like Audible's on there, Amazon, Alexa's actually even on there. Um, Ira's coming to the Blind Shell Classic 2 very soon. Hopefully will also be my eyes. It does have NFC tagging. So NFC, NFC tagging is actually really nice because whilst this reads NFC tags and we do sell NFC tags for the Blind Shell Classic at Vision Australia, you can also get them to, these NFC tags will work with any NFC system. So if your smartphone reads NFC tags, you can also use NFC tags that you buy, you know, primarily for the blind shell, um, but you can also buy them for other systems as well if you need to. But the blind shell classic, which retails for about seven hundred and fifty dollars, um, it's a way of getting out of a smartphone range um, and going into more of a, a feature phone. One thing that the blind shell classic does do is that, which I love about it, it's got an FM radio, so it's actually got besides using internet radio which is fine if you've got cellular and wi-fi access but if you want to listen to terrestrial radio as in fm radio in this case um this has got its own built-in fm radio uh, so you just plug in a set of earphones into the 3.5 mil headphone jack and hey presto you're listening to fm radio um, so I often take this when we go for a trip in the country and I don't have cellular access and I want to listen to the radio, um, I can normally pick up at least one or two or three FM radio stations. So I've got access to a real radio rather than internet radio. Um, and that's the, I'm cheating a little bit here because this is not really an Android phone. But I just want to mention this particular phone because it doesn't really get talked about enough. And this is the Olitech EasyTel desktop phone. So this is the phone that looks like a normal desktop phone. You've got a nice big keypad. You've got a screen up the top. You've got a handset, which, yes, you can pick up to answer a call, put it down to hang up. Um, it's got memory functions. So it's got M1, M2, M3. It's got a loudspeaker mode for doing hands-free. It's got an emergency number. But this is all based on a SIM card inside it. It's actually not plugged into a landline, even though it looks like a landline phone. Um, and it's just a pleasure to use. So this is actually my work phone at the moment. So if somebody rings my work number, I'm actually answering it on this phone. Um, so the really cool thing about it is that if you live in a nursing home, retirement village, um, if you have to be moving around whatever you might be doing and you need a nice, simple, straightforward phone to use and you like to use a big phone, this one works really nicely. And like I said, it's a, a desktop-style phone, works really nicely. 
So that's the Ollie Tech Easy Talk phone. Um, and with that, Amanda, I probably better shut up and um, let you finish off, I guess. David, there are a couple more questions. Do you want to quickly answer them? Sure. Or? Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. Okay. So um, someone's just asked if you've ever tried the Orcam and have any feedback on it. Yep. Trial it before you buy it um, because a lot of the products – sound really good when you're watching online demos but it always comes down to the crunch is how does it work with your particular situation does it work with your documents does it work with where the environment you're going to be moving around in does it read the signs that you want it to read can it read the bus information when the bus when the bus is pulling up so you can organize a trial um, with quantum um, or with the vision australia vision store i'm fairly sure but yes, or because these things are so expensive and you want to make sure they work, trial first before buying. Um, and that goes for not just the the, the Orcam, but for the, the Vision Buddy, the Iris Vision glasses, all of those sort of wearable ones. I always recommend people trial first. Great. And um, what else is there? There's a comment about... It would be nice if the blind shell phone had a GPS navigation app. Yeah, look, it's going to be it's going to be there because remember, if you go into this weird thing called location mode, <laughs> what it does, it tells you what postcode you're in. So if I go into my one, it says uh, Central Coast, New South Wales, two two five zero. So it doesn't give my street address; it just tells me I'm in the postcode. So the fact it's got a GPS function in it already just means that they're just going to write the software to support um, a GPS application. It's like the fact that they're going to be um, offering um, Bluetooth keyboard support and QWERTY keyboard support, as in plug in a, a standard USB keyboard very soon. It's just that because it's running in a custom environment, they've got to create their own interface on top of their own customization to support it so yes it will support a gps application in the future hopefully soon or later and it definitely will support bluetooth keyboard access um, and qwerty particularly for people that have got different accents it'll work really nicely okay and there's also another comment there is also a big purple phone as well that runs on android right never seen it but if it works that's that's fine okay Cool. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Um, all all right. right. So, look, I'll let you um, finish off, Amanda. Yep. I was just um, going to make a comment that uh, Philip has made a comment in the ways in which the OrCam Smart Read has um, helped her for a diplopia, which is fantastic. Um, okay. All right. Cool. So, thank you for attending, everyone. If you have any further questions, um, or would like to explore some of the products David has spoken about today, please visit our web shop, which is shop.visionaustralia.org, or you can contact the team on 1300 847 466. Alternatively, you can also email us at visionstore at visionaustralia.org. At the end of this webinar, there will be a short survey for you to complete. Any feedback that you can provide will assist us in improving our content of future webinars. We would love for you to join us in David's next webinar, which will be held on the 28th of September. And the topic for that will be speak with the experts at Vision Store. So please check your emails and our website for further details. Thank you all and goodbye. Vision Australia. Blindness. Low vision. Opportunity. Opportunity. Vision Australia logo. Three navy blue ovals linked together diagonally within a bright yellow rectangle.